I'll be right in frame. Uh, <laughs> I'm so honored to be here. I told a couple of ladies when we were going to the ladies room, come to my talk, it's going to be life changing, so it better be life changing, huh? <laughs> well, first of all, I want to find out the audience. How many people here are vegan? Okay, so we've got a large vegan audience. How many are vegan curious? We've got two vegan curious. Yeah. Well, let me tell you something. If we wake up one person to this incredible lifestyle, it's worth my trip from Los Angeles to Hilton Head because that one person is going to save thousands of animals over the course of their life and also help us all stop climate change. So I want to thank you, sir, for having an open mind and an open heart and coming here to listen. I applaud you for that because that's three quarters of the battle, just hearing this information. And to the lady back there, I also applaud you. To the rest of you, I want to talk to you about stepping up your game. You know, we are hitting a tipping point. Things are getting more extreme. And every single person in this movement needs to be more than a vegan. We must become a vegan activist. How many people are ready to step it up and become vegan activists? So many people here raise their hands that they're plant-based. We need you to step it up. Raise your hand. Are you ready to save the world right now? Okay, now, so, you know, I know that there's a lot of politics. There's a lot of emotional gravity to this word vegan. I'm not trying to promote a word. I'm trying to save the planet from cataclysmic climate change. I'm trying to help human beings avoid disease that doesn't have to kill them or make them sick. I'm trying to end human world hunger. And I'm trying to prevent the unnecessary torture of billions of animals who are just like our dogs and cats. I don't care about that word. Throw that word out the window. This isn't about a word that's become sort of a hotbed. You know, some people love it. I love it. But if some people feel that that comes with a lot of baggage, throw out the word. We had the terrible tragedy in North Carolina. 40 people or more. You know, the death toll keeps changing, lost their lives. That's a tragedy. Thousands of people saw all their hard work and their livelihood go to waste. Years of, you know, fixing up their homes and having a nice place to live. Trashed in a matter of hours. And we also saw three and a half million, three and a half million animals left in warehouses called CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding organizations, abandoned to drown in the warehouses. There is something morally wrong with that. Do you agree? Do you agree if we have a system where you can't evacuate that many animals, there's no possible way, and we know that these storms are happening over and over again, that it's really irresponsible to just leave those animals there to drown. Imagine those pigs and those chickens in these warehouses, not knowing what's happening, not being able to escape, and the water is rising very slowly. I saw the images that uh, people that I know went to, to the locations and photographed and videotaped entire giant dumpsters of pigs, pig carcasses. And you know, when you look at that picture, you say, there is something morally wrong with that. This is not American. Americans are decent people. And when we find out that something is wrong, we say, hey, let's take a look at that. Maybe that's got to change. So this isn't a political issue. This isn't about you versus me. You know, these storms don't care whether you're a Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, black, white, Latino, Asian, gay, or straight. If they're coming to you, they're going to wipe you out. And I believe it's Mother Nature saying, I'm sending a message because we are 7.6 billion human beings. And I want somebody to guess how many animals we raise and kill on this planet every year, not including fish. I am just talking about 
land animals, chickens, turkeys, pigs, cows, and lambs. Five animals primarily. Anybody want to take a guess how many we kill? How many? 74 billion. He said 80 billion. 74 billion animals. Those animals eat, on average, 40 times what we humans eat. They produce hundreds of times more waste than we produce. Think about it. Cows, pigs, manure. So food is the most inefficient food source, period. Because animals eat a hell of a lot more than they produce as meat or dairy products. It's that simple. You don't even have to be, believe in climate change. It's just that these systems that might have been, you know, doable back when there were fewer people on the planet, now that there are twice as many people on this planet as when I was in high school, it's simply not sustainable anymore. And what's also happening is, while we are raising these animals in terrible conditions, concentrated animal feeding organizations, these animals never touch grass. You've been walking on the grass today? These animals never touch grass. They never see the sky except on the road, on the, on the truck to the slaughterhouse, looking through a little peephole. Now, of course, if you look at the commercials, you'll see these paintings and these murals and these pictures of happy cows and happy pigs and happy chickens. It's all a lie. It's a lie. There is no nice way to raise 74 billion animals. And by the way, I'll probably say something a little controversial. I usually save it for later, but it's on my mind. How many uh, women here consider themselves feminists? Okay. How many people, male or female, are against sexual violation? We all are, right? It's, it's, it's wrong. None of these animals are making love in these factory farms. They are all sexually violated. In fact, there's an industry term. It's called rape rack. So right there, it's not natural. It's not natural. I don't care what your belief system is, but there's something wrong with sexually violating 74 billion animals into existence every year to just to kill them and keep them in warehouses. Now, that's a little bit of the animal cruelty. I just touched on it. I haven't talked about any of the standard operating procedures that if you did once to a dog, you'd be jailed. Castration without anesthesia. Does that sound painful? It is. That's done routinely to farm animals. Tail docking, they cut off their tails. Imagine if somebody came up to your dog and cut off his or her tail, you'd be outraged. Standard operating procedure, uh, dehorning. They dehorn these animals without anesthesia. This is standard operating procedure. These animals do not have the protections of even dogs or cats. And I wanna say one other thing. Um, you know, there are many philosophers who've said that the mark of our civilization is how we treat our most powerless and most voiceless. And farm animals definitely, right up there with laboratory animals, are our most voiceless and most helpless. And you know what they call the animals who drowned? I say who, because they're individuals, they had mothers, they feel pain. You know, pigs dream. Anybody who has a dog, and I've got three dogs, we know they dream, right? Pigs dream too. All those animals who were left to drown in those warehouses, you know what the farmer, and honestly, I have respect for actual farmers. These are not actual farmers. These are warehouse owners. And they're trapped in the system too. I've talked to them. So a lot of them want to get out of it. They're pitted against each other. Who can produce the animals the fastest? It's an evil system for everybody involved. But you know what they describe these animals as? Live inventory. So we have reduced this particular set of animals so low in our society that we cannot even consider them victims. To even talk about them as victims is somehow verboten. You have crossed an invisible line. What kind of a sick society are we living in that we can let three and a half million sentient beings drown? And for anybody in the media, even to refer to them as victims, makes them somehow not serious? Oh, are we humans so exalted that even referring to these animals as victims somehow demeans us? 
you know, to that I would say, being well adjusted to a very sick society is nothing to feel proud of. This is a very sick society when it comes to how we treat animals. And the irony is that everybody's walking around telling themselves and anybody who will listen, I'm an animal lover because I've got a little poodle under my arm. That makes me an animal lover. Meanwhile, I'm wearing them. I'm paying for the killing of them. And you have to know that 99 out of 100 people who are eating all these animals, if you put the animal right in front of them and said, go ahead, do it yourself, kill that pig, you know they wouldn't be able to do it. So there's a level of cowardice there as well. We're hiring the lowest of the low people who really don't have a choice quite often of what job that they want. They're at the lowest level of the socioeconomic spectrum. You over there, you do that killing for me while I walk around and tell everybody I'm an animal lover. How's that for hypocrisy? So this goes across the board. I was watching the news shows after Hurricane Florence, and I'm not, I'm not taking sides here in terms of politics. I stay out of politics because the most liberal commentators and the most conservative commentators and the business commentators and everybody in between we're all talking about the manure lagoons that were about to overflow, and none of them mentioned the animals. Imagine if your life is reduced to such a low position that the only reference point for your life is the manure that you produced, and only in terms of how it impacted people who lived in the surrounding communities. We have reduced animals to the point where they are beneath victims. They are things, they are inventory. And I can tell you right now, Mother Nature is not happy and is sending us a message with every single storm. What goes around comes around. I was a crime reporter for many years. I covered crime. When people committed a crime, an act of violence, we all justifiably wanted justice. We wanted that person to pay for what they did. What is the definition of homicide? The unjustifiable killing of another. But in the case of our laws, it's the unjustifiable killing of another human being. When people do that and they have no justification, it wasn't self-defense, they get punished. They get convicted and they go to jail. It doesn't matter whether they actually did the killing themselves. If they picked up the phone and called the hitman and said, hey, I want to get rid of my ex-wife, my girlfriend, my boyfriend, my boss, my neighbor, and that person goes and kills the victim, the person who made the phone call and asked him to be killed is just as legally responsible. So when you go and buy animal products and eat them, you might as well have killed them. Now, obviously it's legal in today's society, but there are other forms of justice. And unfortunately, while we're killing these animals, these animals are also killing us. Let's talk a little bit about the health issues. Okay, heart disease is America's leading killer. It kills one out of every four of us. I don't know about you, but every couple of weeks, maybe every month, I get a call from somebody heartbroken, understandably, my relative, my my aunt, my mother, my father, my husband, my this, my that, died of a heart attack. And of course I feel sad and I offer my condolences. But a lot of times <laughs> that heart attack didn't have to happen. It's very simple. For the most part, arteries to the heart get clogged. They get clogged with plaque. Plaque comes from cholesterol. Well, here's a little tidbit. There's no cholesterol in plants. You could go all the way up and down this entire festival you will not find any cholesterol, okay? Because only animals produce cholesterol. We're animals, we produce our own cholesterol, and animals that we eat produce their cholesterol. So, heart disease is generally caused by the overconsumption of meat and dairy products that are clogging the arteries to the heart. And in fact, there's a great documentary called What the Health? where in the film, the filmmaker, Kip Anderson, goes to a hospital to talk to a doctor who does heart surgeries. And the PR woman comes out and says, we can't talk to you about that. I'm sorry, it, this is our business. 
This is our business. In other words, we're making money off of people getting heart disease. And that's why I say they're not just farming the animals. They're farming us too. Okay? And the people making money have never set foot in a farm. I can tell you that. The 0.1% that control all of this live in Manhattan. They don't go to farms. They don't get their hands dirty or their feet dirty. So we're being farmed too because turn on the TV. What do you see aside from fast food commercials? What's the other most common commercial you see? Pharmaceuticals. Until you get sick, they can't sell you the cholesterol lowering drugs, which are a multi billion dollar industry. Until you get sick, they can't sell you the diabetes. And there's a connection between diabetes and animal products. Until you get sick, they can't sell you the erectile dysfunction. And not to be x-rated, but erectile dysfunction is a precursor of heart disease because the vessels in that area of the body